Hey everybody, it's Carrie with Seed to Spoon. Thank you so much for joining us today on our podcast, Why We Grow. And today was an amazing experience. We got to talk to the family of Mel Bartholomew, who was the creator of Square Foot Gardening. So whenever Dale and I first started gardening, Square Foot Gardening, that was our book that we first read. We picked this up while we were out shopping one day and it inspired us to get started with our garden. That day, actually, we were out there shopping and trying to figure out square foot gardening and it was it was amazing. So being able to talk with the family of the creators of the, was just amazing. I hope you guys enjoy this conversation that we had just as much as we did. Hi, everybody. We are here with Steve and Laura with the Square Foot Gardening Foundation. We are super excited to talk with them today. Welcome. Hi, guys. Welcome, guys. Nice seeing you both. Nice to meet you. So first of all, I was hoping that you could just explain maybe just a, a quick background of what Square Foot Gardening is, maybe for those viewers who aren't very familiar with it. Sure, absolutely. Square Foot Gardening uh, came about in the mid to late 70s, uh, when my dad was uh, uh, helping out at a community garden. And by midsummer, he noticed that uh, it was totally empty, that everything was overgrown, and everyone had lost interest. And it was, of course, the, the typical row gardening. And he figured, being an engineer and, and also a efficiency uh, expert, uh, he liked to figure he'd come up with a better way to do that. So uh, through years of probably four years of trial and error, uh, he developed a system where you planted in grids uh, and uh, you did not overplant and you did not waste space, water, your time. And he basically took all the hard work out of traditional backyard vegetable gardening and uh, then wrote the book Square Foot Gardening and developed this whole system uh, based on uh, planting in grids. Each, each plant is devised uh, uh, in sizes. So you have a small, medium, large, extra large, like a tomato would be one per square. Radishes would be 16 per square, going to the small size. And uh, the book uh, quickly became the best-selling gardening book in North America. And its companion PBS series is where he got me involved uh, I was always involved in advertising, and uh, I came out to Long Island to help him for two years with this TV show, and we traveled around the country, and uh, the rest is history. That's amazing. So we've actually got the book here. This is <laughs> So if you've seen any of our videos, you've probably heard me talk or Carrie talk about square foot gardening, because this is what got us into gardening. It was our very mm -hmm. first book that we read. I remember we were yeah. at Lowe's, and it was um, mid-2015. And we were, you know, we were starting to toy with the idea we were going to start a garden. And we were in Lowe's. We went to go get some lumber. And I saw this book. <laughs> and Yeah. And he was yeah. like, oh, made by an engineer. I got, I got to yeah. get that. And I, I, can, uh, I think I read parts of it while we were in there. I think we were using it to shop, like kind of in the moment a little bit. And then bought our wood and came home. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, I, I really think, Dale, you know, to your point when when people first started to be introduced to square for gardening one of the things that they realized very quickly was that it was common sense yeah. like mel always said why would you plant a row of lettuce seeds and all your lettuce is going to come up at once you never go to the market to buy 20 heads of lettuce at one time why would you plant that many at once exactly and that's how these mini gardens uh the squares uh, were kind of developed as he got more intensely planting. He tried to figure out how can I get this smaller and smaller and smaller and yield the same results. So it really is 40 years in the making. Uh, Square Foot Gardening, the second edition, is really when he changed the method from growing in your own soil to using a soilless mixture. And it was a game changer for people in every part of the country because, let's face it, your soil in Texas is not going to be the same as your northeastern soil, which is not going to be the same as your southern soil. Mm -hmm. um, so he set out to solve that problem, too, by creating Mel's Mix. So it really did solve a lot of problems for people, and it also solved the problem of waste. 
uh, which was hit, well, that was his pet peeve. He did not like waste. So you'll see a lot of upcycling, recycling themes that run through Square for Gardening. Um, and that was, that was Mel. I mean, Steve can talk about Mel's mother and how he, how all of these things came into play, even in Mel's own childhood, um, how this philosophy all came about. Right, Bart, with Nana? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Growing up, um, uh, Mel's uh, mom, my grandmother, she was an avid gardener. She had your typical huge garden in the back of the yard. And, uh, and, and the garden actually did help feed the family. Uh, gardening started out back in the, you're talking about just after World War II. Uh, those were the traditional victory gardens. They helped feed the family. And indeed, my grandmother's garden was, uh, was, uh, had, had your typical aspects of a single row with lots and lots of produce all coming at once. My dad grew up in that atmosphere. Uh, as an engineer and uh, and also being in the army, he, uh, he he saw quickly that there was tremendous amount of waste involved uh, in that type of gardening. And it wasn't until he retired from his engineering career that uh, he, the square foot gardening developed. Uh, he did not like to waste anything, whether it be his uh, time, uh, energy, money, water. Water is a huge issue now across the globe. And uh, while we don't deal with it as, as much as we should here in this country and other parts of the, uh, the world, it's, it's a massive problem. And square foot gardening helps to alleviate that. So uh, growing up in that type of household where uh, waste, nothing was wasted at all. Uh, there was always a compost pile. Uh, my dad grew up that way. I remember as a, a, a young child going over to my grandmother's house always being put to work in the garden, weeding and doing all that sort of thing. Weeding and, and hoeing, they hated yeah. it. <laughs> and then of course, um, in, in our own yard uh, where we grew up, uh, we had our gardens. I had my own garden. And uh, you grew up with a love of fresh produce that you grew yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's key. I, you know, I think one of the big things about Square for Gardening that was so attractive to me early on was how it eliminated a lot of the things that seemed overwhelming. And it also allowed me to, uh, I think the biggest key ultimately was that that one four by four raised bed, I didn't see as one garden that I was having success or failure with. It mm -hmm. was 16 individual plots that I was having success or failure with. Right. And when like maybe our first year, like maybe only 40 to 50% of them were successful harvests, but still that felt like 40 or 50% success and not just one garden that failed. And I think that... You know, I think this is how successful software development works, too, where you break up a large problem into small chunks and you approach them individually. Mm -hmm. I think that is the way that he basically thought of gardening, too, where you're, you have this overall large problem of we want to grow a lot of food, a lot of different foods, um, and that can feel overwhelming to a beginner. And that was how I felt in the beginning. But making that mental shift of, oh, I'm just going to think about this like software development, where each little square foot is its own ecosystem or its own, you know, wrote it's on its own schedule. It's its own shot at growing food. That was key. Um, and I think that's what helped make it successful. And that's what helped us get momentum going and then get obsessed. And it took over our life. And I think that was one of the key things that he realized that he did. And then, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's exactly the philosophy of what Mel created. It wasn't, all about gardening. It was about equating that one square, looking at it as a mini garden, having success, even if it's in one square and building on that square to go to two squares or three squares. And he even says it in some of his own videos that it, it, it's more of a philosophy of life where exactly like you just said, you take a problem and you break it down into smaller chunks and have success and build on that. And so many people have built on their success, starting with Square for Gardening. It's been, it's been fantastic. And it's exactly what Mel had envisioned. Yeah, there's success stories all over the world. Um, and you guys certainly are, are uh, at the top of the list there with what you've been doing. Well, and thank you. and we, we get stories all over about people that come back and say, I started in the 80s with Square Foot Gardening, the first book, and I've developed it. And, and sometimes people tweak it a little bit for their own use. But the basics are simple and easy to understand for everybody, no matter where they are in the world. 
And the soil mix, like you said, Laura, the soil mix is crucial there too, because that's another big overwhelming thing of, well, I've got to figure out what kind of soil I have and what are the nutrients and what are the pH and all of this. And it makes it complicated. Yeah. So a lot of people come to us and they're like, well, why don't you have all this information about soil and all this stuff? I'm like, well, we kind of do. We have make your own soil mix and now you don't have to think about it, except you add compost and warm, and warm castings every now and then. And some espoma fertilizer if you want to do something, you know, if you want to do fertilizer, do organic. So it's really simple when you think about it that way. And you don't have to. Um, I think that was a big key, too. Those yeah. were the two big things. Yeah, because I think if we it. had to do a bunch of soil tests, we would have been. It would have taken yeah. us another six months to get started because I would have gone down the rabbit hole of wanting to understand it all. Yeah. Right. And, and as you said, too, you know, when you're starting with different soils in different parts of the country and, you, and you're not having success. Um, you know, Mel would get all these questions. Why aren't my pep? Why are my peppers turning yellow? Why is this happening? Why? Well, we don't really know because we don't know the soil situation there. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's in your existing soil. There are many, uh, you know, I know on Long Island, we used to have chemicals sprayed on the potato fields out here that don't dissipate for years and years on your topsoil. Um, you, you sometimes you can't grow in those things because there are too many unknowns and too many variables and it takes an average. I think Mel said it took an average of about seven years of amending that soil and testing that soil to get it really right. Yeah. Why not start with the perfect soil to begin with and eliminate all that? Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I think, I think Mel came up with a lot of push because master gardeners and really experienced gardeners didn't understand that philosophy of you don't have to test your soil. You don't have to add fertilizer. You don't mm -hmm. have to amend it. Yes. And they put them. Um, so I think it, for him, it was frustrating at times, but you know, this is a guy who went all over the country. In fact, he met um, Park Seed, who was the original guy, Bart. Uh, I think it was Frank or John, one of, one of the uh, sons, and we filmed down there in the uh, early 80s. Wow. Really? Down several South times. Beach. Yes, several times. Uh, they, right built a, they built an absolutely stunning display garden right in the front of the corporate offices there in South Carolina. And um, uh, we filmed there several times, and we had a wonderful experience with them. And uh, it turned out to be really nice. It, right. it, 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 it was know, fun. He went all over the country, and he talked to these growers. And he, he saw how they were growing these big tomatoes you know, in little pots. Like, how the heck can you do that? And, and so that's how Mel's Mix was kind of born from, from all of those visits all around the country, talking to experts, talking mm -hmm. to seed people, talking to growers, and, and refining this mixture and method in his own yard right here on Long Island. You know, I can only imagine what he must have gone through, the scrutiny, because when you're a trailblazer like that and you're going against – you know, a lot of years, I don't know how exactly how many years, but a long time that they've been growing the way they were growing with rows and all of that. And you're going head first against that. That had to have been hard because yeah, I, absolutely. I know like some of the pushback we get is a fraction of what he got in the, in, you know, back when he first released this, yeah. yes. now we're more used to raised beds. And, and so that's not as an unfamiliar concept as it was back then, just the fortitude that it must have required to persevere through that. Um, you know, I think that speaks a lot to Mel. I wish I could have met him. Yeah, we, uh, we had he has several uh, several things that he used to do uh, with his videos, and he would uh, do a seminar, uh, and he would say, "Well, all of you that are first time gardeners, raise your hands." And they would raise their hands, and he goes, "Okay, this is a simple concept square foot gardening. It's going to take you an hour or two to understand the whole thing." Then he would go, uh, "How many of you are master gardeners?" And couple would raise their hands and he said okay well it's going to take you a couple weeks because we have you have a lot to unlearn and, uh, <laughs> and the problem was these master gardeners at the time in in the 70s and 80s they looked and said no it can't be that simple i just went through all this education uh they know a lot about gardening they know a lot about plants uh how can it be this simple it can't be and yet uh, they were the last ones to come around finally uh, with a lot of the large gardening groups were the master gardeners and finally saying, you know, this really is simple and it really does work. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So we ta we've <laughs> talked about Mel's Mix a little bit. I know one of the big things I wanted to ask you all about is Mel's Mix to see if yeah. it's evolved uh, over the years to see, especially with the price of vermiculite, because 
and the availability of vermiculite. We've been having it's a so lot of hard. trouble finding vermiculite here. Yeah. Our- one of the big yeah. questions we get is how can we save money on Mel's mix? Do y'all have any tips for that? Yeah, I do. Um, I would say of all things, Mel's mix is an investment because it lasts seven to 10 years. So you have to amortize that core, that, that cost over that time period. I would say don't skip skimp on Mel's mix, but I understand there are hardships for people who either cannot find it, um, who don't think vermiculite is safe, which is kind of an old wives tale, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, there are many reasons why people choose not to use vermiculite. I say two things. If you don't have vermiculite and you can't get it, when you can get it, incorporate it. And we're talking about coarse vermiculite now, not medium, um, only coarse or super coarse. When you can get it, integrate it into your Mel's mix. If you cannot or refuse to, because let's face it, we're, we're using the square for gardening method all over the world. They don't have vermiculite. Mm. Mel always said use compost. So what that component, that one third vermiculite, you just replace that with compost. And I think compost is key no matter what. And we here at the Square for Gardening Foundation always recommend homemade compost wherever, whenever possible. There are so many mysteries about compost that it smells or it draws rats or, you know, those things. If you if done properly, compost should not smell and it shouldn't really draw any critters at all. So um, I would say replace it with compost, uh, even if it's bagged compost that you have to get from your local store, which isn't inexpensive either now let's face well a lot of well a lot of times too like you can find a place that is like a bulk material supply at least in oklahoma we have a lot of these places where you can just go get a truckload of compost in the back of your truck for like a hundred dollars yes that's generally um where we're getting a lot of our compost now we're now that we're on the farm we're making a lot more than we were but i will say if you live in like an apartment or something like that um Mm -hmm. The worm factory that's like a layered worm farm is a great way to make compost too because you can put your kitchen scraps in there and worm compost is even better than compost that's made without worms because you've got all the growth hormones involved. Yeah, we even had a rabbit in the city too. So yeah, (laughs) did you anywhere? Oh yeah, we and we got rabbits. You'll I think Mel would appreciate this idea. We we got rabbits because we wanted to make our own compost. We thought, well, what rabbits produce the most amount of poop? So we got giant rabbits, the Flemish (laughs) giants. They get like twenty pounds. Yeah. So, um, cause they make the most <laughs> amount of poop, right? We want to be as efficient as possible with this rabbit operation. So that's yeah. pretty cute. And I know you had names for all of them, I'm sure. Oh, Probably. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's named. Yeah. yeah. We have names for like 50 of our chickens. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, well, I don't know how you remember and how you tell them apart. <laughs> our five year old, she's in charge of that. Yeah. 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 That's her role. She, in the farm. she keeps track of everybody. <laughs> Good thing you have help. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Right. You know, I mean, one of one of the things that that Mel always felt too was to keep it simple, right? Um, so the idea, especially for a beginner, was to not only keep it close to the house where you can always keep your eye on it and you can always tend it. Once you get all your Mel's mix and everything set up, you you pretty much are looking for something to do. Um, but not to make it so big because it's such an intensive way of planting and you're planting in succession that you're getting three times the amount of crops on based on your cool warm cool seasons Mm -hmm. um, that you don't have to go so big and I, i find a lot of the mistake that people make is that they go gangbusters in the beginning and no wonder why mills mix is expensive Mm -hmm. and then the other issue is they don't want to bend down. So they want to build tall beds. And now they say, well, if I fill my tall bed with Mel's mix, that's going to be costing me a fortune. Well, you don't have to do that. You can fill your bed with sand or topsoil and then only use the six, six inch layer on top of Mel's mix. Mm-hmm. And thereby you reduce uh, the cost of making Mel's mix. Uh, you only need six inches. And that is for sure. Uh, of course, for root vegetables, you grow, you, we grow up. We don't we don't grow down. We grow up using what they call top hats. So you're only using Mel's mix in a particular square that you're growing a root vegetable in and building the soil up. You're not doing your whole bed. So these are concepts that you know we're working on trying to get that point across to people. Um, we've done a lot of work with our website and everything. Like you guys, we've had a lot of growing pains over the years. 
Um, but once they understand that, um, it makes it much more cost effective. It really does. And you don't have to change that soil out for like 10 years. I can't still- imagine how many success stories you've heard from people who uh, hadn't gardened and now are, are growing a lot of their food. Absolutely. I'm not- here. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. We want people to grow. You know, that's that's the main thing. Whether you're using Mel's Mix or not, we want you to grow. But we know that if you follow this method, you ultimately will have success. So that's important too. Um, start small. Don't go gangbusters. You can do it. Once yeah, and there's, so, there's something so satisfying about uh, going outside your, your kitchen door and uh, picking a fresh salad in Absolutely. the morning or, or there's nothing like biting into a, a homegrown tomato. These things, uh, they taste so much better when they're grown right there and they're harvested right there. Uh, even something like uh, uh, melons can be grown in square foot gardening on a vertical vine uh, growing up, of course. And uh, there's nothing like a cantaloupe that you've grown vertically and it's ripened right there in front of your eyes. And, and when you first harvest that, you've, you'll be hesitant to buy melons like that in a store because they just don't taste the same. And uh, it's very satisfying. Yeah. And I think Steve said a key word and that's vertically. Mm-hmm. Um I'm sure people were doing it long ago, but most people stake tomatoes and, and things like that. And ultimately they flop. And, you know, I think Mel was a pioneer also in vertical gardening because the people were doing row gardening. Um, even victory gardens were small, but they were row. And so most of those vining vegetables were sprawling on the ground and that used to drive mm-hmm. crazy. So Lots he started to weave it and trellis it and weave it and prune it. Uh, like tomatoes, to a single stem, and it was able to support the fruit. Same with uh, pumpkins and heavy fruits like watermelon. Uh, he figured out how to put a sling on it and took took my mother-in-law's old nylon stockings, you know, <laughs> and, and slung them up. And I think he really was a pioneer in, in vertical gardening to save space. He certainly inspired us pretty much... Uh... The only way we grow tomatoes is on cattle panels now. We do a lot oh, of yeah. cattle panels for vertical. Mm-hmm. That's our favorite way to grow. Yeah. Carrie yeah. loves arches. Anytime she uh, does yeah. an arch, she we loves do the it. cattle panel arches. So we, we grow a lot of peas and beans and tomatoes up those and Lufa and everything. Yeah. Cucumber, you name it. We grow it up those arches. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, now that's great. vertical gardening before before of that. Yeah. We see so many photographs of gardeners that use those cattle panels in between their gardens that create an archway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See all the fruit and vegetables hanging from that. Yes. It's just a wonderful sight. It's just yeah. beautiful to see. Yeah. And it's cool too because like below that cattle panel in the summer, it gets a lot of shade, but then you can sneak things like it's really hard to grow like cool season stuff here. Like even carrots, it's too hard to grow in the summer here in Oklahoma. But if you get some shade, you have a shot at things like radish. You can sure. keep some of the more heat resistant uh, lettuce alive longer. You can yeah. get an earlier start on your spinach for the fall. So there's just a lot of stuff you can do with shade because sh- we're, uh, believe it or not, shade is a premium here in Oklahoma, at least afternoon shade, because it gets so hot here in the summer that we're, you know, we're going over a hundred for weeks at a time. And it's really hard to grow much of anything if you don't have shade. So being able to do that and save space and use your space efficiently, was one of the big things I learned from Mel reading through that first time because we lived in a standard backyard when we first started. Mm -hmm. So uh, we quickly, uh, I mean, so definitely don't go too fast, but that's exactly what we did was we (laughs) went from no gardens to entire backyard full of gardens in like a year. Well, the first year we did two. Did we? It was two years before. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second year was when we built like six more or something like Mm -hmm. that. But it it was also a great free gym membership, as I will say that too, is having to build all of those gardens. (laughs) It was a lot of weight that year. I got in really good shape. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, You you bring up a good point, a good point, Dale, about the the shade gardening. Uh, A lot of that was developed when we would travel down to Disney World in Florida. We did a lot of filming down there. Some of the Mel's, original Mel's Mix formulas came from um, talking with the scientist in, in one of the exhibits, I think it was called The Land. And some of the old shows we filmed uh, in that area, because in many parts of the world, the first top couple inches is where all the nutrients are. Everything below that is nothing. So uh, the shade aspect of Florida was huge because of the heat, like you said, and, and Oklahoma is a similar, uh, similar thing. 
And that's where he started to develop making just small little square panels of shade. And we grow, and, and even in Florida, you can grow many vegetables as long as you shade them, uh, like mm -hmm. you said, and, and you can get away with that. Uh, they won't bolt as fast. I know you can keep uh, certain lettuces from bolting by just giving them a, the proper amount of shade. And it's, it, it, it is really simple. I mean, he took a clothespin to, to put them on the, uh, on the uh, little frames, but uh, there's many different ways that people develop doing that. But shade uh, gardening helps uh, extend your season quite a bit. Yeah, he would actually take chicken wire and bend it over that one square mm -hmm. and shade cloth on it and just attach clothespins to it. Huh. So you could have a sun crop here and a shade crop here. Yeah. And that's the vermiculite, just to get back to that again, and that's why vermiculite is really important because it holds mm -hmm. moisture better than anything. Absolutely. Um, we don't recommend perlite at all. Okay. That stuff dries out. It floats to the top. It's It's not natural looking. It blows away. It's almost like... It's almost like those little styrofoam balls that you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like the yeah. like when you get something, you know, you buy a lamp from Wayfair, right? And you get that styrofoam thing and those little pieces fall all, all over the place. Kind yeah, of it's important. Like it's important for your audience to understand that per, uh, perlite is not used for water retention. It's strictly used to aerate the soil. And it, it, it rises to the top. It, it gets blown all over by the wind then. Uh, so perlite, a lot of times when you buy your bedding plants from the nursery, there you have perlite in it. It's, it's cheap. It's easy to use. And it's really meant just to aerate the soil. It does not have water retention properties. Not like vermiculite. Good to know. That is really good to know. No yeah. wonder why you didn't like perlite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we kind of discovered that organically. Yeah. Because we, we stopped yeah. buying it after a couple of times. I mean, it just doesn't work as well. Yeah. I didn't like the mix. I didn't like the consistency of the soil with it. It just didn't. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, uh, the nursery has put it out there. It's cheap. It's, it's, it's easy. You know, it's, you can find it. Um, but we don't consider that a substitute. If you're going to substitute vermiculite, um, do the compost, two thirds, compost. one third peat or coconut core. Okay. Well, that's great to know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have a flow chart. Um, we'll, we'll get it to you guys so you can put it up. Um, awesome. Or you can put it up uh, when you do this live yeah. or recording. Okay. So what are your guys' favorite things to grow with square foot gardening? There's nothing better right now in, in spring than a fresh, fresh uh, salad right from the garden. So to me, the arugula and the different lettuces and spinaches that we're harvesting each day just makes an absolutely fantastic salad. And that said, uh, in, the, in the heat of the summer in August, slicing tomatoes and, and, uh, and, and alternating them with some freshly made mozzarella is just to me, that's summer here on Long Island and, and we love it. And so tomatoes and fresh salad, you can't go wrong. Yeah, I mean, I would recommend for people to grow what they like to eat. Again, you don't want to waste. I mean, if if you want to grow more than you need, grow it with the intent of giving it away to someone else who might enjoy it. Um, I like to grow eggplant because I love the way they look when they're little babies. Mm -hmm. I just love the whole flower, the way it's like a little umbrella, and then there's a little baby, and then it gets a little bigger. Um, and oh, be quiet. And I like to I like to cook, so. Yeah. Eggplant is something I normally don't seek out when I'm at the supermarket, but when it's hanging there and it's shiny, it's calling my name. What's a recipe I should know for eggplant? I love to cook and eggplant's one of those things I haven't figured out yet. I only cook one thing, Dale. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's a Greek dish called moussaka. It's probably not the best for you. That's fine. I'm down with that. <laughs> it is. It's so excellent. It is delicious. I'll give you the recipe if you want. Okay. I'll, I, I'll get it from you and we'll try it. Yeah. We'll make absolutely. it for sure. Uh, it's to make it right out there. And, and every year we're like, what are we going to do with this eggplant? Because we always I, I just want look to at them because they're beautiful and we give them to the animals. Yeah. We always want yeah. to grow it. We want to eat it. And then we never figure it out. It's about the time we're overflowing with everything else. Yeah. So we're struggling to keep up with everything else we're trying to eat. In the garden. It's yeah. It's, a, it's not a favorite, the eggplant. Yeah. No, but uh, Laura's moussaka is incredible. Look at it as this way. Moussaka is, is like uh, lasagna is to Italian um, cuisine. Moussaka is, is similar to Greek cuisine. Okay. And, uh, yeah, very similar. And uh, oh, is it good? I love trying new recipes. That's oh, yeah. like, we love geeking out on the weekend. Uh, 
we've had weekends where we'll, we've tried like eight, you know five or six different recipes or something or oh yeah um, well that's how i came up with like all 10 zucchini recipes yeah was that was like, like one weekend of like yeah. what are all the different things we can make with this zucchini yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should we should create some recipes or work on a book together because i love to cook up i just made stuffed zucchini last night it turned out really well oh i love zucchini recipes i think we're on an idea here Laura. yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think now so. that we have one of those big outdoor like hibachi griddles, you know, like the flat top griddles. Have y'all yeah. seen those? Yeah. Um, we got ours at Sam's Club. Like, I love these things. And I love cooking outside, especially because there's just something about it. And you just uh, like last night we made a stir fry with fresh kohlrabi from the garden. Yeah, and we had a bok bunch choy of stuff. and peas and um, nice. onions. And oh, it, it was so amazing. Good. Yeah, we just we went and we harvested a bunch of stuff from the garden right beforehand and went out and with how big of our family we have like we got one of those giant griddles so i'm making like a giant batch of it and then we got leftovers it's uh it's awesome it's one of the that great sounds things. great tell it tell us what time we should be over yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey we would love to have y'all over anytime y'all are in oklahoma please yeah we definitely are going to come pay you guys a visit but but yeah. let me ask you you know you mentioned the kids so i, I have yeah. a question for you guys and um how do you find the kids like eating vegetables from the garden the two that have grown up with it their whole life love it. Uh, for them, it's normal just to walk out there and snack on some broccoli leaves or like what or sprouts and, and stuff. Like they're just yeah, spinach. Like they'll just walk out there, grab a spinach leaf, yeah. and eat it. Yeah. Now the two older kids grew up. They've had two different lives. Their first life was a lot of hamburger helper, and then you know like stuff like that, or like whatever was quick and easy to make, or fast food. You know, like we didn't okay. eat that great. Um, so it's just it's. You know, it's just two different lives. Um, but they're doing like they loved the stir fry last night. Like yeah. everybody loved it. Yeah, they're just not going to walk out and eat a kale leaf. Yeah. That ship is sailed. But <laughs> um, <laughs> with the two younger kids. Yeah, and yeah. I think it helps too because the younger kids help more in the garden because they're. I mean, because they, they go out there, they plant a lot with me, and yeah, and so they mm -hmm. see it grow when they're like, "Can we? Can we eat it yet? Can we do it yet?" Yeah, the so teenagers aren't as excited about gardening, you know. Yeah. But I think that's just how teenagers are. So this is, this is the one thing that um, we want to focus on uh, for the future of the foundation. And that is teaching kids, which we do a lot of now. Um, we have certified instructors. So certified instructors have either worked with Mel directly in the past, or they've taken our new course and have worked with us. And once we certify them in the method, we know that they understand the method. And then they go out to the wider world and they teach other people how to do it. And we, we find that we have over 600 certified instructors across the country. Amazing. Uh, yeah. So that's going to be the future of the foundation. We, we intend to grow that number so that we can be more international. We have many international certified instructors as well. But kids seem to really take to square foot gardening. They like the organization of it. Mm -hmm. um, they like a square because many times a teacher will assign each child their own square. So they're responsible for their own square. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And we work with some groups, uh, specifically YMCA's in uh, mostly the Jersey area with one of our certified instructors, Bob Markey. He started a program there that's been super successful, but a lot of these kids are inner city kids and they, they, also have eaten fast food and things like that. And they understand what ketchup is because it comes in that little packet and they know what it is and they like it on their French fries, but they don't know where the French fry comes from and where yeah. the ketchup comes from. But when they take Bob Markey's course, a summer camp course at the YMCA, they grow potatoes and they grow <laughs> tomatoes <laughs> and they know where it's coming from. And they're putting this connection together in a way that is sometimes life-changing for kids. Um, so like you were saying, your own children, you've got two different, you know, almost lifestyles. Mm -hmm. uh, many inner city kids are not involved enough in gardening. Many school children are not involved enough in gardening. And so one of the focuses that we have is on summer camps, uh, schools, and homeschooling, which has become huge. Yeah. So that's where we were. Ho we are hoping to put more emphasis on education down the road. We're so working. How can people go about finding these classes. Yeah, how can we get involved? This sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we have 
over 600 certified instructors, and many of them are active with Square Foot Gardening, many are not. Uh, but the active ones, sometimes we don't even know what they're doing. For mm -hmm. example, um, many of them start Square Foot Gardening in community gardens, and they go to outreach programs and the underserved communities, and they help feed underserved communities, but they help teach underserved communities how to grow. So that's, that's something that we find out. Uh, that also can extend to prism, prison programs or at-risk youth programs. So we kind of stumble upon a lot of these. If you read our newsletters, we usually, uh, we usually highlight a certified instructor who's doing something really cool in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to connect people to these certified instructors to get involved. In fact, there's a certified instructor in Colorado who did these, tra she, she's working with these transition homes. So it's like homeless people who are transitioning off the street to these tiny homes, right? To, to give them a sense of responsibility uh, and a sense of caretaking. And what she did was she incorporated Square for Gardening into that program. So not only do they have their own tiny home to help transition them off the streets, now they have to care for a garden and start to grow their own food. So there are a multitude of things going on with Square Foot Gardening out there that either we stumble upon or we know about. And because of the pandemic, we just haven't been able to get out there to really showcase them. Um, but people are doing fantastic things with Square Foot Gardening. So we try to recommend that people contact us. You can contact us at info at squarefootgardening.org to find a Square Foot Gardening certified instructor by you. And these people are certified, so they will have a, an embossed certificate um, they will be um, basically taught by the foundation and have taken our, our coursework. Mm -hmm. uh, so look for them. They're, they're all over the country. They're doing great things if people want to get involved in any way. And make sure that, they, uh, that you guys out there let us know about your projects. I know um, Laura and I will be in Globeville, which is a suburb of Denver, in July uh, to see this, these tiny homes. And these, uh, it's an at-risk community. And uh, they're doing just wonderful things with all our elevated beds that uh, each small, tiny home has one right in the front. Okay. And uh, it's it, it's quite a sight to see uh, people using square foot gardening as part of their lifestyle to transition out of uh, something that was uh, much more difficult for them. I think that's you know, something we haven't talked about yet. But, you know, one of the big reasons why we started gardening was for mental health was, mm -hmm. you know, I worked on the computer all the time. I needed a place in the physical world where I could just go be one with nature and, and it's almost like a meditative experience for me when I'm in the garden. And I think that experience is crucial. We've been a part of a number of programs that are uh, for people of different backgrounds, you know, different experiences. And I think the one thing that connects everybody is that gardening generally I've seen has helped everybody that's tried it. Yeah. Um, unless they get too fresh with their tomatoes, then it can cause your, <laughs> you know, but um, you know, but for the most part, you know, I think gardening for me is more of a cathartic exercise and being connected to nature and uh, just unplugging from the digital world. Because, you know, whenever I'm plugged into it 24 hours a day, I lose my mind. So I've yeah. got to have a balance of both. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a great point, Dale. And square foot gardening um, is, is so easy and simple. It's designed that way. It, you can't uh, you can't help but not be successful at it. Mm hmm. Which is, which helps you want to want to do more, and uh, and it brings apart that 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 sense of betterment that you're when you're behind a screen twenty four seven for some certain periods of time. Uh, being in a garden really uh, helps that. Yeah, and I'm I'm always amazed when I look back now. You know, since Mel passed in twenty sixteen, I've been intri intricately involved in in what other people are doing with square foot gardening and finding them and what they're doing. And I'm always amazed. I mean, when you look at things like um, you guys and you look at um, um, the seating square and you look at Garden in Minutes and you look at Epic Gardening and you look at all these people who are having this great success helping others grow, um, many of them, if not all of those that I mentioned, started with Square for Gardening. And so we're, we're okay if you go on to other things. We don't expect you're going to be a square foot gardener your whole life if you don't want to be. That's fine. But to have that success and that springboard is really rewarding for us to carry on this mission that, that Mel started. It, it, it's just fantastic. So we're happy people take it in whatever direction they want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I want to say again, you know, thank you um, to, 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 you know, to Mel, but to what your family has done. You know, I know it's a family effort. I know, Steve, you mentioned you were there, you know, helping do all the marketing. I know that, um, you know, I, I look at you two and I wonder if, and I hope and I dream that it's what uh, my kids do with what we've done. You know, so I, I look to, sorry, I'm getting emotional for a second. <laughs> but, you know, I, I look at y'all and, and I think that that is success in my mind is that ultimately uh, one of the biggest successes I see that Mel had was that he inspired his own kids to keep doing what he was doing instead of being like, I ain't touching that. <laughs> you know, so um, I think it's really cool what y'all are doing. And um, thank you for inspiring well, us to grow and, and everything. So. Thank you for both of you two. I know my dad would be extremely proud of you both and what you're doing. Uh, you guys are, are bringing to the world uh, Square Foot Gardening the way it should, should be. Uh, you've taken it further and, uh, and uh, you've done an amazing job with it. And I know that's what my dad wanted. He wanted to make Square Foot Gardening more of a household name so it helped people with their lives. He wanted people to create businesses for it, from it. And, uh, and I think what you guys have done is uh, spectacular. And I know he would be very proud of what, uh, what, you've, you, what you both have accomplished, especially uh, with, your, with your two littlest ones too. Uh, that's exciting, uh, having the, the next generation growing up in a garden and appreciating the benefits of, uh, of gardening. And in this case, specifically square foot garden. So thank you both. Well, I think we can see what growing up in a garden does because that was you, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, honestly, I, I was a flower gardener. I didn't grow vegetables. Yeah. I'd go to the market or to the farm stand, and that would be that because I was too intimidated by it. Um, you know, Steve and I spent over 30 years in our own advertising and marketing business while Mel was doing his thing. You know, we were busy raising a family, so we weren't always involved in Square Foot Gardening, only until he was ill and we looked at, his life's work. And we realized, wow, this guy has really made an impact. And mm -hmm. this is something that should be put forth and not just put by the wayside. Uh, so that's when we, we kind of really took the torch. It was very much later after we were kind of done raising our kids mm -hmm. that we took this torch and decided to, to help other people learn to grow. And, you know, Dale, we talked about it before, you were one of the first people that when I was looking for people who were doing square, what's a square for gardening? Who's doing what? I don't know what I'm doing here. You were one of the first people that I latched onto saying, wow, this guy really gets it. He understands that it's not just gardening. It's a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's a way of dealing with problems that are, you know, that are overwhelming, but you can break them down into segments. It's a way, see, now I'm getting emotional. It's a way of having a small success and building on it. Um, it's getting out to nature. It's doing all those things that you use. It's not sitting in front of the computer. It's getting kids involved. It's bridging generation gaps. Um, this is something that you can do with your grandkids. Uh, so, so it, you know, when we found that, we, we were like, wow, this is really impactful. This can, this can really go forward, especially in the digital age where, you know, Mel hadn't really gotten to that cusp yet. You know how technology is just, it keeps flying and we, we can barely keep, keep up with it. Um, so we just kind of took what he already had made successful and brought it to the digital age. Um, so we really can't take the credit for it. it. Every Mel had guided us in every way by his past books and his past videos that he had done and his mm -hmm. writings and his philosophy. I mean, even now we're finding boxes of little drawings about all kinds of stuff he envisioned for the future that we haven't mm -hmm. even touched yet. So he was a visionary in many ways, and he wanted to truly help the world. And I think he has. No, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 100% agree. Yeah. So we just, you know, that's, those are pretty big uh, garden mucks to fill. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're a flower gardener and a, an advertising guy. <laughs> well, you know, we, we appreciate uh, that you appreciate what we're doing. Uh, we hope we can get the world to, to grow, uh, especially during these trying times. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, can you share your website and email and everything for us again? So that way the everybody can hear it. Sure. The website uh, for us would be squarefootgardening.org. And if you have questions specific to that, we have a wonderful team and uh, they'll get us uh, either forwarded to us or to the right people on our management and our, uh, our operations team. And that would be info at squarefootgardening.org. Awesome. And if you haven't bought this book already, this is the second edition. Okay. So go yeah. check out the third edition if you're looking for it now. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started, when we went full time working on From Seed to Spoon, one of the first things I did was I bought this book for our two developers and had them read it because I felt like they need to really understand gardening and they loved it. They, um, uh, they, they loved the way that it presented information, especially if you're a technical type person, I think you mm -hmm. will really love square foot gardening. Yeah. Well, just, I love your, I love your seed to spoon app. I love it. It's I'm a visual person mm -hmm. and involved in advertising and marketing my whole life. I'm a visual learner and I, I find your, uh, your app seed to spoon just fantastic. I keep it right here on my phone and uh, it's right there for me. And it's just so easy and intuitive. That's the key. It's intuitive and easy to use. Uh, I love what you guys did. It's wonderful. Yeah. You guys did a great job. Yeah. And, uh, Thank you know, you for coming from you all. Thank you very much. Yeah. We, we, we've been following you from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, seeing your growth. Um, it's it's just great. It's like it's like watching a you know a little plant grow from a seedling. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are ready. You guys are ready to harvest. <laughs> <laughs> well, this yeah, baby is ready to harvest. I yeah, think. she's about yeah. a month away. So yeah. that's definitely. <laughs> you got another another one that's going to be raised. Ooh, you congratulations! Congratulations! That's wonderful. You'll see a, you'll see gardening videos with a baby out there here in a few months. It'll yep. be out there uh, helping us do some stuff. Yeah, this will be number. Five. 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 Oh, I thought you had four already. Okay. Yeah. Wow. We got to come and see the see the team. <laughs> yep. Everybody has their. Yeah. Own. We have Everybody five goes. human kids and about fifteen goat kids. So there's a lot of uh, kids around here. Yeah. Love the goats. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, you know, I, I hear about the, uh, you know, the formula shortage, and you realize that, you know, America is only starting to feel the pinch of things that you know, we're having shortages on people mm -hmm. around the world have been feeling this for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So we do, we do work with um, other organizations. Um, one in particular, Cultiva International has put in over 2000 square foot gardening boxes in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And he's helping the indigenous Mayan people learn about not only growing their own nutritious food, because they basically had a corn diet, which, has stunted many of the children and their growth. Um, but he's, he's helping lift these people from poverty by empowering them and teaching them that they, they are able to, to grow their own and take care of their own and learning about nutrition and all kinds of other things. So he's doing great stuff there. And we have another gentleman that we're working with in right now. He's based in South Africa, Andrew Pott who's taking square for gardening to new heights in he's working with a self watering square for garden box. Oh, cool. uh, that, yeah. That could be work really rolled indoors if necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and also because theft is a problem at times um, and also be grown almost anywhere. So mm -hmm. we're working with these organizations to really help people grow food in, in food deserts. So that yeah, will be, of the foundation as well moving forward. This uh, garden box uh, that's being developed uh, has just won a very prestigious uh, international award uh, for innovative design on new products. And uh, this has just happened last month. So it's exciting because it's going to be rolled out uh, throughout Europe and Africa uh, very shortly. And it's, it's interesting to see how it's developed and, and we have a couple of them that are on their way here for us to, uh, to, to test and to try. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the course of the last year to watch this develop in its design aspect has been most interesting. It's very gratifying for us because it's square foot gardening has come such a long way. Uh, I spent two years in the early 80s with my dad producing and directing the TV show for PBS. And just technologically and where the world has gone in that period of time, uh, square foot gardening is still evolving and developing. And it's interesting to watch and see 
And I have a good feeling that it's going to be around for a long, long time to come. Absolutely. Do you know if those uh, old videos are still available, Steve? The old PPS videos? I would love to watch those. Yeah, you know, uh, Dale, let me see what I can do. Uh, um, can I, mention, I, I, I bet it drives some traffic. I, I well, it, it, it very well could. Uh, they're, they're, they're interesting to see. Um, we don't have the, uh, the master two-inch uh, tape or one-inch tapes that we filmed on mm. um, and the field tapes. We do have stuff that's been brought down to DVDs. The quality is not great, but we do have some, uh, like Laura had mentioned, uh, uh, my dad continued with square foot gardening after the early 80s, and I went uh, back into advertising and marketing, which is something that uh, we did for the last 35 years. Uh, so we have some availability, but not as much as we want. We reached out to several of the PBS stations. Uh, I, we produced this show for WNET here in New York City. But sadly, uh, so much time has passed, they did not keep the masters either. Uh, but that said, uh, we do have some old stuff. Uh, I even have a blooper reel that was done. That's quite funny. Uh, my dad funny. had a really good sense of humor. And sometimes uh, working in the garden in a hot summer, uh, you had things that happened. Uh, we had, you know, certain insects or bees would uh, find him very attractive in the summer and, uh, and just pester the heck out of him. Uh, Living uh, near a uh, fairly close to a, a regional airport, uh, plane traffic was always an issue, and they come right over the top of you, of course, almost like they knew. So we had a lot of fun filming the show. Uh, thank goodness he had a good sense of humor because it wasn't easy at times. Uh, mm -hmm. We incorporated our uh, he incorporated his grandkids in there a couple times, and of course, trying to get a two and three year old to do what you want when you want for a TV show is uh, is. Uh, you guys may know is it's not always the easiest thing it's like yeah. hurting cats i can feel it i i feel what he went through <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, we have a blooper reel that we're uh, considering putting out there that's pretty funny uh but uh we we had a lot of fun filming the show awesome well i can't wait to see that <laughs> well it was so good to talk with you guys um i'm honored to chat with y'all and uh i would love to be able to do it again sometime this was awesome yeah Thanks yeah. Thank today. you so much. Thank you, Thank guys. you too, for what you do. Uh, yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Happy Bye. gardening. Bye. We'll talk soon. I'll send you the recipe. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.